there was an incident in 2013 where a 10 year old boy in San Diego died from rat bite fever after he adopted a pet rat from Petco and his family ended up suing Petco. So rat bite fever was in the news and became the catalyst for this debate on how safe rats are as pets. And ever since then, I've heard more people bring it up and I've gotten more questions about it. So if you're new to rats or maybe thinking of adopting, you're probably wondering what this is and what you're getting yourself into, which is good research on your part. And I had a request to do a video on it, so let's talk about it. Rat bite fever is a zoonotic disease, which means it can be passed from animal to human, and it's caused by two strains of bacteria. The first is Streptobacillus monoliformis, and it's from North America, and the second is Spirilla minus, and it's from Asia. Contrary to the popular belief that you need to be bitten or scratched by a rat, rat bite fever can actually be contracted from any close contact with rats or other rodents, or from even getting scratched by something they've been in contact with. Um, in the case of pets, that would usually be their cage or toys, but you can also contract it by ingesting something that's contaminated with the bacteria, um, like urine or feces, and that's better known as haveral fever. That one gets its name from an outbreak in 1926 when contaminated milk made the rounds in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Rat bite fever is not an illness that physicians are required to report to the Center for Disease Control in the United States. So while we've got some case studies to go by, there aren't really any solid numbers or statistics to show the prevalence of it. And infections may be caught and treated successfully without ever being specifically diagnosed as rat bite fever anyway. But um, mice, gerbils, cats, and dogs have all been found with this bacteria, though cats and dogs get it from eating infected rodents. Symptoms are typically pretty flu-like. After exposure to Streptobacillus monoliformis, symptoms could take anywhere from three days to three weeks to appear and you could expect fever, nausea, vomiting, chills, headaches, rashes, and pains in your muscles and joints. The infection can be confirmed with a blood culture. After exposure to Spirilla minus, symptoms usually start popping up somewhere between a week to a month. That includes recurring fever, swollen lymph nodes, sores or swelling near the bite wound if you have one, and rashes. The infection can be confirmed with blood samples or tissue and fluid samples from sores. Both bacteria are usually treated with penicillin. If you're allergic to penicillin, there are other antibiotics that can be used in its place. If it goes untreated, either your body is going to clear it up on its own, which I wouldn't place my bets on personally, or the infection will get more severe and lead to abscesses in your internal organs, or you could get really lucky and get the rare added complications of pneumonia inflammation of the heart, hepatitis, sepsis, or meningitis, among other things. So the mortality rate is estimated somewhere between 7 and 13 percent if left untreated. Anyone who has frequent contact with rodents, including us pet owners, will obviously be at a higher risk of rat bite fever. There are going to be two important ways to be safe. The first is being clean. Wash your hands with antibacterial soap, keep their cages clean and well ventilated, Use disposable gloves when cleaning your cages or when handling poop and urine. If you're bitten, then clean and dress the wound appropriately. Don't let them near any open wounds on your body. Don't bring them into the kitchen where you store food and where you cook. Don't wash their cage items in your kitchen sink. And be sure to disinfect whatever sink or bathtub you do use to clean their stuff in if you use one. Wash your clothes with detergent and hot water if they're peed or pooped on. And don't mix your laundry in with theirs. Make sure you don't have any sort of wild rodent infestations in your home where your pets may come in contact with a wild rat or mouse. And I mean, this is all basic hygiene and care, so you should be doing it anyway, regardless of rat bite fever. Second is going to the doctor when you're sick. Whether you've had contact with rodents or not, the symptoms that you'll get from rat bite fever are all red flags that your body's giving you that something is wrong and you should not be ignoring that. If you're having some of the symptoms of rat bite fever, make sure to tell your doctor if you have pet rodents and about any bites or scratches that you've had recently so that it's on their radar. Streptobacillus monoliformis and Spirilla minus are both part of the normal flora of bacteria that are found in the respiratory tracts of rats, and it can be found in their saliva, urine, and feces, 
so it doesn't manifest as an illness in rats. And there aren't any reliable tests out there that can definitively confirm that a rat can or will christen you with rat bite fever. That's where the recent lawsuit that I mentioned earlier has come from, because it's claimed that Petco didn't adequately test the rats that they were selling for the bacteria, and they weren't properly informed of the risks involved in having pet rats. So basically, rat bite fever is rare. It's not some rising epidemic, nor is it really a major concern as long as you're cautious with your health and with the health of your pets. My take on this whole thing personally is that when you're adopting a pet, any pet, you have a responsibility to do the research yourself prior to adoption, and that includes assessing the risks of a pet. It's not reasonable and it's not responsible to rely solely on a pet store to teach you everything you need to know. The 10-year-old boy who died in San Diego actually already had one pet rat, and his family got him a second rat of the opposite gender so that they could breed these two pet store rats with no prior breeding experience and have their own little rat family, which sounds so cute but is so irresponsible. And I don't get the impression from that whole thing that the family had ever really taken it upon themselves to learn much more about pet rats, or they probably would have already read about rat bite fever. Having their son die is a horrible tragedy. A preventable tragedy, but a tragedy nonetheless. But I guess the point that I want to make is that it's a totally preventable scenario as long as you're well informed and well prepared, and sadly, this boy's family was not. That does not mean that you are going to die if you adopt a pet rat. If you want to read up more on rat bite fever, I'm going to link some more information below in the video description. So thanks for watching guys and see you soon.